I love video games. Who would have thought? I played quite a few games last year. I didn't finish every game I played last year, but I did finish quite a few of them. Some that I've meant to play for some time now, and some that I've just started playing on a whim. This is a list of games I played in 2023, not the list of the best games that came out in 2023. I didn't do a best of 2023 for game releases that came out that year because financially it is a lot harder to keep up with that and I wanted to play more of the stuff that was kind of in my backlog. Anyway, I hope you like cool visual transitions because there's quite a few of them. Let's go. God damn it, man. This game is so fucking weird. Like, I love it, but I also don't. Ultimately, I left Sonic Frontiers with positive thoughts, but it has a lot of issues that I want to see improve. Firstly, the controls are better than Forces, but still have some wiggle room to be even better. Sonic still feels stilted, but with genuine good ideas for movement. I love that the boost is more of an energy meter, and when you use it with well-timed jumps, you can utilize some crazy creative shortcuts. Secondly, the open areas are fun, but visually bland for a Sonic game in my opinion, and Island 3 is just bad in terms of how camera works and level design. Thirdly, the cyberspace levels aren't bad ideas, but after the first area, they tend to just kind of exist and really rip off of other Sonic level designs. Okay, with the issues aside, what about some of the positives? The game has such a good soundtrack. Some of the best Sonic bosses out there with some of the best boss music. The game structure is really solid and makes exploring feel a little more rewarding than in a game like Sonic Forces. And the story actually made me tear up a bit in a way that I wasn't expecting for a fucking Sonic game. Overall, I left Frontiers with an overall positive attitude, but man, Sega needs more original levels with good design and actual good controls, boost or no boost. I wanted to like this game more, but as is, I think it's good. Samus Returns on 3DS was an absolutely necessary remake of Metroid 2 that happened to release a year after AM2R got taken down, but hey, you can find AM2R anywhere now, so... Anyway, this game naturally pushes Metroid forward in terms of its combat and bosses, but in a few areas the game feels limited, but that could be because I played Dread before this one, and Dread is just way better. What's here is definitely good, but in terms of the map exploration and the overall package, it's probably my least favorite mainline Metroid title. I have yet to play Fusion, but for now, Samus Returns is at the bottom, and I want to reiterate it's not because it's bad, it's because it feels a little bloated to me. It lasts longer than I think it should, especially since the final areas are not the most fun to explore. Again, the bosses are great, a bit frustrating, but rewarding when you figure out the boss's patterns, and the game's finale definitely had the potential to be awesome, but you just kind of fight the cool final boss, and then it ends. A good necessary game, but definitely outshined by most other Metroid titles. A PS1 classic that I played out of curiosity and for a relatively quick and valid platinum trophy. This game is so damn charming, man. It has a gorgeously cartoon-esque low-poly style that makes each of the levels feel wacky, and fun. As one of, if not the first 3D platformer, it's actually not that dated in terms of controls. I was able to adapt to the controls relatively quickly and even had a good time just jumping around the levels. It doesn't rank much higher because the gameplay is repetitive, but to the game's credit, it is short enough to where that's not too much of an issue. It's short and sweet, but not the most replayable game with some basic standard objectives. I love the personality in this game though. I'm a big fan of that aspect. I got a PS5 this year, and I used it to play some old PS4 games I haven't touched. And with Forbidden West releasing not too far from the beginning of 2023, that's when I decided to play through Zero Dawn. And I liked it, but oh my god, this game is so hard to go back to once you finish it. I love the world design of Horizon, making it a sort of apocalyptic setting with plants growing on buildings and old tech being on display in certain areas, and the soundtrack actually does a lot to exemplify the feeling of the world. I played the game on hard, and it got me to think about combat scenarios and how to approach them quite a bit. I actually liked it. The big bosses were kind of whatever to me, at least the huge plot bosses were, but the bandit camps were my favorite objectives, so much that I actually did all of them before I finished the main story. The stealth mechanics and skills are so fun to utilize correctly, and with how many bandits are at these camps, you have to maneuver and re-strategize a bit, especially on your routing. With that being said, Zero Dawn side quests are kind of mid. Not bad, but boring enough to where I just stopped doing them because they weren't fun enough to keep me going. Not bad, but boring enough to where I just stopped doing them because they weren't fun enough to keep me going. 
The map is huge, and my only issue with that is that it takes so long to get to places. Thankfully, you can craft or buy fast travel packs, and I don't know how easy they are to make, but I was close to running out when I revisited my save file, and even then warping to a near point of where you need to go only lessens the blow of needing to run or ride for minutes at a time. Some people like that feeling. Personally, I only like it if the side content is enjoyable, and it wasn't enjoyable enough for me to be okay with it. Besides the bandit camps, those are legit my favorite parts of the game. I've played Paper Mario before, but I've never finished any of them. In fact, I don't even think I've finished a single chapter. Until now. I totally get the love for this game and its world. It's a very fun spin on the world of Mario, and it really shows how much personality the Mario universe can have outside of the main games. The dialogue is fantastic, and the turn-based combat with action commands is fun and feels rewarding to get good at. The scenarios in each chapter are usually very fun and enjoyable, and the party members are awesome for each of their own reasons. Except for Watt. I hate Watt. My issues with the game only really lie upon the combat getting very repetitive by the end of the game, dungeons being relatively simple, except for the last couple. Those were actually kind of interesting. The main issue I have is the lack of an interesting plot using Mario. And yeah, I know, I'm asking for a plot in a Mario game, but that's only because the writing in this game is so good. The dialogue is legitimately fantastic, I just wished it was used to tell a slightly more interesting plot. Overall, though, this is a great beginner RPG for newcomers or veterans to enjoy, and with the Thousand Year Door remake coming out later this year, I'm excited to see how that game improves on the original. Especially since people mainly talk about the Thousand Year Door. Also, this is leagues better than Sticker Star, just saying. Cute dog 2D platformer with grappling hook physics as a main mechanic? Pretty epic. Genuinely a fantastic time. Only thing I have to say about it is the levels earlier on aren't too interesting, but later on they become awesome. Although the final level has a bug on Switch, at least on my end. The bug makes it to where if I die after a checkpoint, it doesn't save any of my collectibles, specifically on the final level. I 100% grabbed everything I could before this point. The bug kind of held me off from grabbing absolutely everything. I still kind of want to do it, but maybe after some time passes or a fix comes out. Heck, maybe a patch came out already and fixed it. Overall though, the game is adorable and kind of addictive. Fun dialogue, fun designs, pretty good pixel art, and super fun physics. Go check it out. This was one of the very first things I did with my Nintendo Switch OLED, and it was a good time, but I'm also fully aware it's just because I like Smash Bros. Getting every spirit in the game is definitely a bit of a grind. It requires quite a few in-game resources to do, whether you get it through the World of Light shops or RNG rewards. However, World of Light is only a grind through trying to navigate the map properly, especially since they are huge maps. The spirits are really cool, nose exhale worthy references to the history of gaming and Nintendo. And while I think the spirits are cool, they do just become pick the gooder one, please, near the end since it is a rock, paper, scissors type of mechanic. It is mainly this low because I can see the flaws. But I like Smash Ultimate, and this mode lets me play a ton of Smash Ultimate. Especially since the game looks gorgeous on the OLED screen. Battle for Bikini Bottom is awesome, and while I definitely don't think Cosmic Shake surpasses that game, Cosmic Shake is definitely a good mix between Battle for Bikini Bottom and the movie game. It makes a more linear adventure with a hub world, optional side missions, and collectibles to grab. This game is just a fun 3D platformer. Simple level designs with some interesting gimmicks, good moves, and upgrades as you go, and interesting enough level plots to carry the pace. Movement is fun and satisfying, and the level themes vary quite a bit. My least favorite thing about the game, however, is the post-level collectible missions. These work better in 3D Mario games where the worlds are open, but in this game you do just have to go from the start of the stage to the end of it. I know you can warp to checkpoints, but without knowing where the collectibles are, that mechanic isn't going to be that useful. Other than that though, this game was a good time to play from start to finish. Nothing groundbreaking, but it obviously doesn't need to be. It just needs to be a fun time.
I loved Marble Blast when I was a kid, whether it was Gold on PC or Ultra on Xbox 360. Marble It Up Ultra is the big release continuing that type of game. And yeah, man, Marble It Up Ultra is under the same caliber as Marble Blast. So many customizations, fun level designs with great physics, shortcuts, and a pretty fair difficulty curve. Nothing quite beats the feeling of utilizing the physics to grab secrets or just to get gold or diamond times on the levels. The devs put so much love into this game just to make it a worthy successor to Marble Blast, and I would say that they hit the nail on the head perfectly. Play it. It's a great game. The PS5 pack and title that utilizes the console's controller and graphical fidelity. And I actually played it a few years after it was released, and I also played it months after getting the console. I'm talking like 11 months after I got my PS5. As a pack and game, it's actually a great time with quite a bit to do. Definitely the perfect game to play while other games install, and I don't mean that as a sarcastic comment. I love Astro as a possible PlayStation mascot, and this game really shows the personality of this little guy through the console specs. The levels have great designs with a ton of PlayStation references throughout, and a ton of PlayStation's history. My favorite personality thing in this game is the GPU jungle music having the GPU sing at Astro. They also use the DualSense controller perfectly, and it makes me hope that other games can utilize it way more down the line. Astro's Playroom is a pack and title you shouldn't sleep on. Probably the best pack and title that's been bundled with a console in years. I didn't know there was an ending cutscene. I just played this on Switch one night and got the rocket cutscene, so here it is. It's Tetris on Game Boy. It's still one of the best versions of Tetris, and it's still one of the top three Game Boy games. It's good, I don't need to explain why. My first Picross game I've ever played. And yeah, man, it's really fun. I technically didn't beat this one, but I have played a lot of it and I wanted to talk about it. I just think I found out that puzzle games are one of my favorite genres because this game is so fun and rewarding. Use numbers and context to clear the correct blocks and make some pixel art. It's so addictive to do puzzle after puzzle and see what the picture becomes, even if it is just simple pixel art. I really need to pick up some of the Picross games on the Switch eShop. Seriously, if you haven't tried Picross and love puzzle games, Fucking play it. It's so good. I'm a Resident Evil newbie, which is strange to say because I do love Capcom and Resident Evil is the biggest Capcom franchise out there. So what did I think of Resident Evil 2 Remake? I thought it was pretty awesome. Resident Evil 2 has such a good feel to its gameplay. Every shot I took felt like it mattered, and the atmosphere sold that well alongside the satisfying sound design. The puzzles were fun and simple, stressful situations were so exhilarating to get out of, and sitting by one of my best friends going through each story was just a fun time. It has its awesome dumb moments, and its off-the-wall sequences, and that's what makes Resident Evil as good as it is. The design and feel is amazing. I genuinely don't have any complaints. The only reason it isn't up higher is that I preferred other genres of games on this list, but don't sleep on this if you think you won't like survival horror. I think it's well worth your time. Question for you, do you honestly just like it? I get the feeling that not the case for the Before any of you judge me. Yes, I'm biased. Persona 5 Tactical rules, man. It's so addictive, to the point where I keep thinking about it months after playing it. They converted the One More system to a tactics game super well. It's so satisfying to get out of a fight in a minimal amount of turns, alongside utilizing second Persona passives effectively. The party members are pretty well balanced, and a few of the systems in the game actually push you into trying out all the different party members. The music is awesome, the style is fantastic, the story actually isn't bad for a spin-off title. I definitely would say this is a better spin-off story than Persona 5 Strikers, and yes, I also still like Strikers. Persona 5 Tactica actually builds its plot up well between each arc, and when the game gets cool with its presentation and cutscenes, it gets cool. I actually went into Persona 5 Tactica thinking that I'd like it, but I didn't expect to actually end up loving it. Try it if you're a fan of Persona 5, I don't think you'll regret it, and no, I haven't played the DLC yet.
I beat Mario Odyssey years ago, but I never grabbed everything in the game, so with my new Switch OLED, that's what I decided to do. The first time I did it, I hated it. It felt like busy work, the levels weren't fun to play, and I just found myself being frustrated the whole time. But that was only the first time. I 100%ed it twice this year, and the second time was way more fun. I think it improved on me because I routed which moons to focus on, and knew what I was getting into more than I did the first time. Plus, the way Mario moves in this game is a dream, and combining that with routing what missions to do first and the quickest way to do them, you get a pretty satisfying feeling of dopamine the more you get in a row. That doesn't mean I enjoy every mission, fuck volleyball and jump rope, but most of the them were super fun to go through a second time. Super Mario Odyssey is still one of the Switch's absolute best games due to its ideas, music, scale, presentation, and historical respect for Mario as a whole. Two masterful Mario games in a row, and this is probably only higher than Odyssey because of the new Mario game high, but this game is just so damn creative and cool. Every level felt like it had care put into it, especially aesthetically. This is one of my favorite looking Mario games ever. The Wonder Flower isn't as gimmicky as I thought it would be. It does genuinely add interesting and creative level ideas and obstacles along with crazy new secrets. The second level shows you the singing piranha plants. This alone pushes it above Odyssey for now. I love these little guys. Super Mario Bros. Wonder is full of wonderful ideas that keep the game fresh and pulls Mario out of the new Super Mario Bros. hell he has been stuck in for over a decade. I hope whatever comes next for 2D Mario is just as wacky and inventive as this because man, this game is a certified keeper. Masterpiece alert! Bloodborne is fucking phenomenal. I think about this game every day now. This is my first Soulsborne-esque game, and I get the appeal of these games now. I didn't really get it with Dark Souls, but Bloodborne's world and mechanics captivated me. This is one of those types of blockbuster video games that actually uses the player's reactions and gameplay to build up its world. Bloodborne will unveil new intriguing areas, bosses, or terrifying situations just to test how you respond. Once you learn and adapt, you can start exploring the areas to find helpful items, extra bosses, lore, or even other hunters with side quests to do. The combination of the gothic aesthetic with Lovecraftian horror is a blend that works super well. The music is fantastic, selling every mood in the game. The bosses are great, obviously. The weapon concepts and builds are fun to try. Man, this is quickly becoming one of my favorite games ever made. I got the platinum for it, and I even bought the DLC and got all the trophies for that just because I felt like I needed more. I was not a fan of the Chalice Dungeons, it felt a bit too grindy, but the last Chalice Chalice boss was actually really cool, so I thought it was a good end to the chalices. Learning how the game's systems work and how to properly parry and build myself against bosses was an amazing experience, and I can't wait to replay this game as soon as possible. Well, that's every game I finished last year, and yeah, I didn't really play anything bad last year at all. This year, I've already played Kirby's Return to Dream Land Deluxe, Metal Slug X, and Sonic Superstars, and I'm definitely playing Persona 3 Reload while you're watching this video. So I hope you're ready for me to cover those in the list of the best games I played in 2024, and let me know what were the best games that you played in 2023. Could have come out that year, you could have just played them that year does not matter to me. Just let me know. It's a great discussion to have. Also, please, if you take anything away from this video, it's don't judge me. It's my list, you motherfucker. <laughs>